their like their whole understanding of what we call marriage, relationship between how how God created man and woman to be together in oneness was so broken. In the first century, it was at an all-time low. It was horrific. They were basically, Israelites were basically selling their daughters. They were property. Here we go. Clock started. Video number three, women in ministry. I originally intended to do only three videos, but I'm going to do four to start off with. I originally intended to just do three to kind of launch the topic. We're going to have, we have all these playlists on the channel and I just want to keep adding to them and rehashing and going over things over, over uh, topics that I think are really important uh, in our day. Um, I had a guy tell me recently, he's like, you always talk about these, you know, controversial topics. And I'm like, ah, I think what I'm talking about is sensitive, not controversial. Controversial would mean it's unbiblical. Like there's some type of, well, it may be biblical. It may not be. It may be Christian. It may not be. I don't talk about stuff like that. Everything I talk about is biblical. So women in ministry is not controversial. It's, um, it's not controversial. I don't know if I'd call it sensitive. It's so plain. There are three passages in the New Testament we need to look at, and we're going to look at those in the next video. But I wanted to give a recap and then add uh, add another passage we want to look at before we get to those difficult uh, passages. And the reason I want to do that is because of context. So this whole video is about context. <clears throat> Allergies. Got to love it. So this whole video is about uh, context. You have, I learned this in Greek. I learned this in Greek. Um, you can make a, a, a passage or even a word say anything you want. Um, if you ignore context, um, we can, we do this, we can do the same in English, but to start with Greek, um, when you look up, uh, I know the, if anyone has the amplified, uh, translation, which I do not like personally, because it, it, in the Amplified, you'll read it, you'll be reading along and it'll give you like, you know, a little on the spot word study and it'll give you like three or four different words. And you're almost like, Ooh, I like this one. Like you get a pick. Uh, sorry. No, you can't do that. Like there's scholarly opinion that I don't even have. You know, we don't get to pick and choose what we want the Bible to say. Uh, I don't like the Amplified. So, you know, but that's there, there's words depending on the context can mean a variety of things. And, and, and like in all my uh, all my Greek tools that I've learned to use over the years, that's why we go to college. I don't I didn't go to college to learn Greek. I don't know Greek. I don't speak Greek. I cannot look and read Greek, you know, and look and, and tell you, you know, if a word is a is a first person singular aorist active subjunctive. I can't do that. I don't. I, I I have a program that does it for me, and I've learned to say, oh, this is what an aorist is and how it fits in the sentence. This is how a participle. This is what an infinitive is. It's different than a finite verb. It's an infinite verb. Oh, and this is how it functions in the sentence. That's why I went to college to learn how to use the program, learn how to use utilize Greek. I know a little bit of it, but I'm not qualified to make to make exegetical decisions on grammar. <laughs> come, come on, man. Very few people are. And yet we get these translations where you get to like pick whatever word you want. And I'm like, what? That's so silly. Um, you know, so when I look up in a Greek dictionary called a lexicon, it'll give you, and we're going to do this here in, in a little bit. We're going to look at uh, a word um, that's going to be used in uh, Matthew. And it's, it's, it's got like five or six different translations. We translated divorce, but that's like the last word that's used. Anyway, so context is extremely important for interpreting a word um, because depending on what context is, the word can change. And again, we do the same thing in English. Take the word run. I can get up in the morning and go for a run because I want, I want to be in shape, but I don't like to run this time of year because it makes my nose run because of all the allergies. 
which will make me want to run down to the store to get some sinus medication. And there's lots of different sinus medications. I'm going to run through my mind which one I want. Ah, those are all the same word. And they mean completely different things based on the context. Same thing in Greek. So this is why we study. Uh, and if you take these sensitive topics outside of their context, you're going to misunderstand them. So I want to walk with you through this. I want to establish some context when we talk about women in ministry, because we're not talking about Americans. This is not like the Bible was not written in an, in a, in an American culture. And so, you know, we have to look back in their culture. We have to look back at the early church and the message that was given. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's jump in. It's going to be good. I really feel like this video is really important. The context of this conversation is found in the idea of redemption. Redemption, both for Jesus, Paul, the entire early church, was that God came to redeem us back, to pull us back into his original plan, his dream. God had a dream. It was perfect. He's not given up on it. If you don't want it, you don't have to get in on it, but I want in on it. And if you, if you want in on it, you're a child of God, you're a Christian, you're going to go be with him forever in a new heaven and a new earth. That's the deal. Okay. So it's, it's, there's no plan B and no plan B. God's not giving up on, on, on plan A. There's, it's always been plan A. So when we want to talk about, you know, the message of the gospel, we, you know, the early church context of that gospel was the beginning. We're going to see this with Jesus in, in, in Mark 13, uh, Mark 10 and Matthew 19, when he talks about what we call marriage. Um, so let's, we need to get in on this. We need to get going on this. <clears throat> Try to keep these relatively short. The context of this conversation, as we begin in the first video, begins in Genesis chapters one and two and three with God's original intent and original design for men and women um, as he created them in the kingdom. Um, so when you come back into Genesis um, chapter one, really the verses we look at, begin to look at are verses 26 through uh, 31, and probably really through 30. Um, God's done all this creating and you get this little, this little, it's really cool verses 26 through the end of the chapter. You get this little inside peek into like this inner dialogue of the Trinity. Like they've done all this creating and, and, and the language that's used is in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our own image, in our own image and in our likeness. And it's like, hey, I got this idea. So they're all talking together, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I got this crazy idea. What if we made man in our own image and our own likeness? And when he says, let us make man, we assume that he's talking about male or specifically Adam. And that's not what he's talking about. Man should be translated there, and it is in certain translations, mankind. We're going to create a type of creation in our image and likeness, okay? And we know that that's how you interpret that because he does the same thing in verse 27, and then he surrounds all of that language with plural them and male and female. Um, so this is how this sh shakes down. Let us make mankind or humanity in our image and likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So this is not, this is not Adam, it's them. And the only them is Adam and Eve. It's not like, you know, let's make them Adam and Eve and Steve and John and Bob. That's not, there's, there's no Steve, Bob and, jo Bob and John. Okay, this is let them. So this is Adam and Eve. And then that's elaborated on. He clarifies in verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. Male and female, he created them. <clears throat> now it does say in the image of God, he created him. And we explained this in the first video. The him there is masculine language. It's, it's and I don't understand this part, probably to study it more, but it's how they wrote and it's how we talk. I've mentioned this before. My daughter it was talking about her birthday party recently and she's having all of her girlfriends come and it's going to be, it was, it was great. We had a great time. But um, she was talking on FaceTime and I'm in the kitchen and she's in the living room and I could hear her talking to him and she was, what are you guys going to wear? And I'm thinking, 
it's, of course, this is my world, right? And I'm not 16 year old girl world, but in my world, I'm thinking, oh, she used guys to talk to all of her girl friends. That's kind of just like in Genesis. I might bring that up in my video. That's, that's how dads think. I think that's how this dad thinks. So it's when you read in here, so God created mankind in his own image and the image of God, he created him. That's guy language, but that's male and female. He created them. Okay. So it's just, a, it's a way they write masculine language and you can study that on your own. It's self-evident, I believe. So he begins in verses 26 and 27 by making mankind this type of creation in his image and likeness. And they've got all of this. They got all of this authority that they, they're they going to walk in, not just Adam. Adam wasn't the one just to rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock over all the earth and all the creatures move along the ground. It was male and female. It was Adam and Eve did that. In fact, he goes on in verse 28, it gets even more pronounced. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, okay, and increase in number. Adam couldn't do that by himself. Fill the earth and subdue it. That's in the same breath. Adam and Eve were to fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living creature that moves along the ground. I give you every seed bearing plant. Like all this, you can read through it. We went through it in the first video, which if you haven't watched the first video, go back and watch the first video. There might be a link in the description or something on the screen. Leland, the, he's awesome. He does all that. Go back and watch the first video. All these mandates by God, these assigned authority, you know, authorities given to, you know, given by God. We're not just given to, to Adam. They were given to Adam and Eve. So that's chapter one. Uh, chapter two, you, you move into, and as we described, chapter one, verses 26 to the end of the chapter is like this kind of overview. It's done several times throughout scripture. That's how, it's, that's how they wrote. I don't know if it's, but that's really weird because it's like, it wasn't like their design. It wasn't like, oh, this is how we're going to write. It was, it was like, it was, you know, because the prophets, they they taught like this. And so that kind of, you know, let's give you the, the the overview and then break it down in detail. That's That goes on through the prophets and Genesis, all throughout Revelation. So you come into chapter two and, and it's basically God's taking this verses 26 through the end of the chapter one, and he pulls it apart and he says, I want to focus in on some of the details. And the details is he's taken this man because he made Adam first and puts him in the garden and, uh, you know, he's working, going after it. And, you know, God looks at him and says this astounding, astounding thing. He says, this ain't good. And you're like, whoa. It's a, <laughs> I thought, God's like perfect. How could this not be good? And I think probably the idea would be this is, un we can't leave this unfinished. Because at the end of every day, God like created and he was like, I killed it because I'm God and I'm perfect. But he comes into chapter two and he looks at Adam by himself and he says, can't leave him like this. This would not be good. This can't be, this can't be done. He needs a helper. He needs a helper suitable to him. Now, again, this is before he gets to the woman creation stuff, obviously. And so um, he begins to look and I love that little part here. You know, he begins to look, um, What what is that ver in the verses? It's down in verses... Uh, 19 and 20, he's looking at all the, that he created and they, you know, they're, they've all gotten mates. They've all got, you know, community and Adam has no one to fight with. He has no one to argue with. And I say that funny, you know, that's not the idea, but Adam's alone. And so he, he, there's some significant language that there's no, there's no helper. There's no one that can, is suitable to be in community with him. Like equality is the language. He looks everywhere. I mean, he could, he could have been like, you know what? He needs a chihuahua. I mean, come on. I got a chihuahua. Chihuahuas are awesome. You know, he needs a parakeet. That's what he needs. A goldfish. That's not what he's talking about. He's like, he needs community and equality. And there's no one could do that. No one. I mean, no heaven, no earth, no angels. Because again, Adam's the pinnacle of creation. He killed it. There's no one else. And it, it, he's like, well, and this is what the argument against same-sex marriage is. He could have just created another whatever out of the dust of the earth, another woman, another man. He could have done that. But that's not the design. He literally, because true community is oneness. And so he took Adam and he didn't, he, Adam was created out of the dust of the earth. And he did not, you know, create Eve out of the dust of the earth. He created Eve out of Adam. That's so huge. They're different, different body parts. 
and they come back together in oneness and intimacy. That's that's what we that and we'll get into the whole marriage language, but that's that's the deal. That's what happened. And she he literally made Adam deficient. We go through all this in the first video, but he made him deficient, taken out of him, and he made a helper suitable, equal. That's why in the in the first chapter Adam and Eve could labor together. Now, the result of sin in chapter three, the result of sin, specifically the phrase that, you know, when God speaks to the woman, that your desire will be for your husband in verse 16 of chapter three, and he will rule over you. That's the result of sin. So they were created like this and they became this. Adam was here. Woman was here as a result of sin. So anytime anyone talks about marriage or ministry in the kingdom with this language, it's sin. It's a result of sin. That's sinful thinking. It's broken thinking. It's warped thinking. And Jesus came to redeem us. This is why we're going to look at this passage. We could look at Mark 10. I like the language in Matthew better. In Matthew 19, Jesus is questioned on divorce. And he points them back. He's into, we're going to go through this, but he's at the, the whole idea is he says, listen, just so you know, I have come that what my father began, the dream of my father, we're going back to that. Whatever you want to call that, wherever that is, we're coming back to that. So everything going on now, this is huge. So the equality of women, the roles of women, that's interesting. When you, we talk, we talk about, oh, I hear people all the time. They're like, okay, male and female are equal. Okay, yeah, man and woman are equal. They just have different roles. There are no roles listed in Genesis 1 and 2. Drink that in. They both were ruling. And I'm not against roles. I'm not against roles. But what I'm telling you is, is that when we begin to pigeonhole, a woman is to minister here and a man is to minister here, I'm saying we're being unbiblical when we do that. Because that's clearly not what's going on. Now, there's natural things. A woman can give birth. A man cannot. I don't care what kind of trans argument there are. A biological woman created by God and his design, can. she's the only one that can give birth. A man cannot do that. So she has giftings for that. But we're talking about ministry in the kingdom. Like hospitality. Well, that's going to be a woman. That's chauvinist, man. That's this, you know. Women can't preach. Women can't teach. That's not true. That's just not true. So we need to take those passages, which we're going to get to in the next video, that deal with teaching and women in ministry. And we're looking at them in this context of equality, not in the context of sin in Genesis chapter three. This is what Jesus is getting at here in Matthew. And I like Matthew, again, Matthew 19. I think we have some more information than, uh, than we have in Mark. And I won't go into that, but there's, there's Matthew is an expanded, uh, synoptic, um, presentation of the gospel. It's a little bit expanded than Mark. So in Matthew, he, Jesus, uh, has these Pharisees come up to him and listen to this. They're asking him this crazy question. And everybody, let me just say this. Everybody wants to look at Matthew 19 and and think it's about divorce. It's not about divorce. It's about their broken understanding of intimacy and relationship between man and woman. This is what it's about. It's not about divorce. And here's why. Some Pharisees came to him and says, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Listen to this. It's interesting. They came to him to test him. Look, verse three. Some Pharisees came to test him. What do you mean? Test. They've got it down. There's no way we're going to pin him down on this one. We're going to, we're right on this one. So this is their understanding of marriage that it's lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason. Does that even, and Jesus' response is like, you are so broken. Marriage, and we have a video on this. Uh, I think it's in Redeemed Sexuality, but uh, or it's, 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 we'll put a link in the, in the description on it. But uh, in fact, I think it's on marriage in heaven. We did this whole thing on marriage and all that, which I don't want to get wrapped up in here. But they're like, their whole understanding of what we call marriage, relationship between how, how God created man and woman to be together in oneness was so broken. In the first century, it was at an all-time low. It was horrific. They were basically, Israelites were basically selling their daughters. They were property. They were selling their daughters for like cows. <laughs> I mean, they adopted from the Canaanites and from the Babylonians, from the ungodly cultures of their world. That was their view of marriage. 
like they were to come to Jesus, like, that, uh, is it, oh, tell me I'm wrong on this one, kind of. And Jesus is like, dude, you're so, that's so twisted. I can divorce my wife for any and every reason. She was property to them. This is not about divorce. This is not about divorce. This is why in this passage, especially, he doesn't even go, I mean, he eventually gets the whole Moses permitted a, a certificate of divorce because your hearts had become so hardened. Why, why is he saying that down in verse eight? Because they have drifted so far from this design. They're so sinful. This isn't about, Jesus is not concerned about divorce and, you know, and who gets the kids on the weekends. It's, that's not what he's talking about. Their whole understanding of marriage, they weren't, they weren't, before you can talk about divorce, you have to talk about what marriage is. The problem was in marriage. And he says, listen, here's the big deal. Haven't you read this? Verse four, that in the beginning, or rather that at the beginning of creation, the creator made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. They're no longer two, but one. This is what marriage is. Let me say this really quickly. I have people all the time say, we're not going to be married in heaven. Before the fall, God looked at Adam and said, it is not good to, you know, it's not good to leave him outside of community. It's not good for Adam to be alone. He needs a helper. Marriage was not a solution to the fall to fill the earth. The fill the earth was before the fall. Sex was before the fall. Intimacy was before the fall. Man and woman were created and this was the creation. Mankind. This is how mankind Verses 26, 27, and 28, this is, this is how mankind was defined. Mankind is not defined like this. Mankind is defined like that. And so Jesus reminds him, he says, we're going back to that. In fact, he says in verse 6, so they're no longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. We're not, Jesus, says, you want to know what's going to be like in my kingdom? For men and women and intimacy and how they're going to function in my kingdom, you have to look at it through the lens of chapter 1. So, of Genesis. He goes back to creation. So when we talk about women in ministry, and, it, and there's a lot of other things here, obviously with marriage and relationship and all that. But if you're going to talk about women in ministry, you cannot talk about women in ministry under the effects of the fall from chapter three, where man rules over woman. You, for Jesus' perspective in his kingdom for sons and daughters of God as Christians, you have to come back to Genesis one and two, which is they were adequate. They were not deficient. That a man and a woman if a man is ministering, the woman is with him. And in oneness, they literally, there's this cooperation, same as the female, same as the female. That's what's so significant. That's the context. So these difficult passages we're going to look at in the next video is, you know, the context of that is, is Genesis 1 and 2. This is why Matthew 19, Mark 10, all these passages on divorce are so important because their whole understanding in the first century of, of relationship, you know, and, and I, in heaven, I'm not sure, like, we'll call whatever we will be married because that understanding of marriage, I mean, no eye has seen, no mind has conceived what God has in store for those who love him. There's just a whole different deal. But this idea that God made mankind in one way in the beginning and then in the in heaven, well, we're changing it. I'm going to improve on it. You can't prove on perfection. There's no evidence that redemption looks different. That just seems so plain to me. Seriously, that seems, I don't know how you can argue against that. So I hope that helps. We're establishing context for the for the next video. And you're probably going to have to watch this a few times unfortunately we've been, we come out of a church culture where it's oftentimes, you know, roles, um, roles, not only in marriage, but in ministry take on more of an, un, you know, an ungodly sinful um, perspective rather than a biblical foundation. God was the first to institute women in leadership kingdom ministry. Genesis 1 and 2. Sin, it changed. Jesus came to bring it back to that. In, John, in, in, in Genesis chapter 3, sin caused man and woman, he will rule over you. Jesus came and said, ah, I don't think so. We're changing that. So we got one more video, 24 minutes. Hope that was good. 
See you next time.